Good morning. Good morning. Your Bible's open there to Colossians 3. It says, If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above and not on things of this earth. To read a short story for you. It's a true story. It says, Don't try to come in, Frank yelled through the door. I have a bat and I'll hit anyone who comes in. Come on, open the door, Frank, Joe responded from the porch. We just want to talk. This is getting out of control, Jenny said as she pulled at Joe's arm. I think we should call our lawyer and have him talk with Frank. But the, report, or, but the realtor and the buyer will be here in 10 minutes. The deal will fall apart if they can't get in to look at the house. It will fall apart a lot worse if Frank goes after them with a bat. I'm going to call right now and postpone the meeting until we can do something with Frank. Think there's conflict going on here? Okay, but I won't let him hold up the sale forever. You've got two days to get him out of here. Jenny, and after that, I'll come back with my own bat, and I'm sure John and Matt will be happy to join me. Now, this is a family. These are all brothers and sisters, okay? Joe stormed over to his car and drove out of the farmyard, venting his anger by spinning a wave of gravel across the yard. As Jenny drove back to town, she felt utterly trapped between her four brothers. Ever since their mother died, they had been fighting over the farm. Frank had been born with a disability that had kept him at home all his life. In the early years, their mother had cared for him, but as her health failed, Frank became the caregiver, rarely leaving her side. When she finally succumbed to a massive stroke, Frank's world collapsed. Things got worse when their mother's will was read. She and their dad had established a trust many years earlier to provide for Frank. In their wills, they left the farm equally to their other four children. Now that both parents were dead, Joe, John, and Matt wanted to sell the property as quickly as possible. When they told Frank, he was terrified at the prospect of moving out of the only home he had ever lived in. And he resisted the idea. Heated arguments ensued, and now Frank was concerned, or now Frank was cornered in the lonely farmhouse. Although Jenny needed the money from the sale as much as her three brothers did, she did not like the idea of forcibly evicting Frank. The three brothers were oblivious to his fears and determined to push ahead. Jenny felt powerless to stop them. Then she remembered that her pastor had recently attended a seminar on biblical peacemaking. A brief call to him led to a meeting that night which resulted in an intense discussion with three of her brothers. Look, Pastor, Joe said, I'm only asking that we honor Mom's wishes and follow the law. She and Dad decided years ago to set up a trust for Frank and divide the farm among the rest of us. As personal representative of her estate, it's my legal responsibility to honor her will. I know it will be a little hard on Frank to move out, but there's a nice apartment complex in town. He'll settle in there in no time. Something that happens every day. Conflict. Family conflict. How do you deal with a situation like this? Is there a way to handle this that doesn't require a baseball bat? That doesn't require making somebody leave the only home that they ever knew? How do you deal with conflict? Now you saw the three brothers, they wanted to sell the house, right? And they were more than happy to get that sale going and get Frank out of there. Because that's what the mother had stated in the will. But let me ask you, if you look at the heart and the motive, were they really concerned about Frank? Were they really concerned about doing what the mother wanted in the will? Okay? He'll settle in there in no time. But it could kill him, Jenny pleaded. Losing mom devastated Frank. 
If we force him out of the house, he'll lose everything that's familiar to him. And I'm afraid what that will do to him. So what do we do, Matt injected? Just sit around until he dies years from now and finally divide up the property? I've got two kids in college, and if mom were here, I'm sure she wants to see the farm sold to help them out. I agree with Joe, we should honor mom's will and follow the law. I appreciate and respect, or I appreciate your respect for your mother and the law, said Pastor Barry, but there's something else to consider. All of you here confess to be Christians. So what is the difference between the way you are handling this conflict and the way a good atheist would handle this conflict? And I will say the same thing to you sitting here this morning when you deal with conflict. And it's bad conflict. It could be church conflict. How do you deal with it? And is there any difference between the way you deal with conflict and the way a good atheist would deal with conflict? There are ways Jesus has set through Scripture to biblically deal with conflict. The problem is, is most of us do not know how to deal with it or what those ways are. Conflict scare a lot of us. To some of us, conflict is just another obstacle to be overcome as quickly as possible. But to others, conflict is a way to show God's power and Christ's love in how we deal with it. After several moments of awkward silence, Joe finally replied, I'm not sure I see your point. Well, let me put it another way. What is more important to you in this situation? To get your money as soon as possible. See, the pastor knew what was going on. To get your money as soon as possible, as most people would, or to demonstrate the love of Christ to your brother. Oh, I see, said John. You want us to be good old Christians who just give in to others and walk away from what's rightfully ours. No, that's not what I'm saying. God loves justice. And we certainly want you to respect your parents' wishes. But there is something he wants even more. And that is to see you treating one another in a way that shows the power of the gospel in each of your lives. So this, brothers and sisters, is why I bring this to you this morning and why I want to go through this series. And that is because conflict is something that is going to happen. You cannot avoid it. You live in a fallen world and you deal with fallen people. Conflict is going to happen out in the world, it's going to happen in your family, and it's going to happen here in church. But you need to understand that conflict is God's way of showing the world that He still has power to work in the lives of His people. The question is, is do you know how to deal with conflict in a biblical way that shows Christ's love? That sounds good, Pastor Joe replied, but I don't see how religion applies to this problem. If you really want to know, let's pray together right now and ask God to show you how you can resolve this conflict in a way that honors Him and fulfills your parents' wishes. God answered their prayers in a way that Joe never expected. Three weeks later, the entire extended family gathered together in the banquet room of a local restaurant. Jenny had somehow overcome Frank's fears and persuaded him to leave the house and join the family for dinner. Twelve ne nephews and nieces watched with rapt attention as he walked into the room and nervously sat down at one end of the table. As the eldest son, Joe asked for everyone's attention. Frank, Joe said, our family is gathered together today to honor you. For the past ten years, you devoted yourself to caring for mom. And today we want to present you with this special plaque, and it says, To our brother Frank, the best of all sons, who care for our mother with selfless love and undying devotion. Your companionship filled her life with joy and delight and was a constant reminder to her of the love of God. With deepest gratitude to a wonderful brother, from Joe, John, Jenny, and Matt. 
Tears welled up in Frank's eyes as Joe handed him the plaque. Before he could speak, or before he could speak, Joe handed him an envelope. Frank, he went on, in appreciation for all you did for Mom, we want to give you this gift. It is an agreement we have all signed that gives you a life estate in the farmhouse. That means you will be able to stay there as long as you live. We found a buyer who is willing to purchase the rest of the farmland. Ownership of the house will eventually pass to our children. But as long as you want to live there, we want you to know that it is your home. As Frank clutched the envelope, the dam of emotions finally burst. Months of uncertainty and fear gave way to sobs of relief and gratitude. As Joe leaned over and hugged his brother for the first time in years, Joe's teenage son leaned toward his sister and whispered, Maybe there is a God after all, because there's no way Dad would have done this on his own. Amen. A terrible situation that when they finally came to the point of giving it to God, and opening their eyes to, yes, religion does have a part in these situations, that they came to a resolution that honored everybody in the family. But more than that, it honored God and showed His power. Isn't that what you want in your life? Isn't that how you want to deal with conflict? It's a whole lot better than going after each other with baseball bats, right? Okay. So how do you handle conflict? Is there a right way and a wrong way to handle conflict? Ricky, can you turn to Colossians 3 and read verses 1 and 2 again? If then you are raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above and not on things on the earth. So. When you deal with conflict, where should your mind be? Um, On things above, right? But for most of us, when we get drawn into conflict, we don't think about things above. We get drawn to our human natures, and our minds are on things here on this earth. Okay? And when I say that, what I mean is that we respond in how we usually deal with conflict. Sometimes that's by running away from the problem. Sometimes that's by being very aggressive with whoever is bringing the problem to us. But most of the time, it's not by having our minds set on Christ and thinking of heavenly things and acting in that manner. Most of the time, it's by dealing with them through an earthly manner, through our selfish human nature. Is there really a way to deal with conflict that God can actually work through you in doing that? Well, that was very weak. Let me tell you. And that's why we respond to conflict the way we do it. Okay? Because we'll say yes, we'll shake our heads, but as soon as conflict comes, we forget everything we just said in church, and we go right back to what our default, default setting is. Right? Now, there's one honest person here. She keeps shaking her head. And I know this to be true. I know that if I do not put my mind on things above and think of Christ and have Him actively dwelling in my mind, when I come to conflict, I'll handle it the way I always deal with conflict. And that usually does never work out the way I hoped it would. Never. Donna, where's my pen? Up there. Up there underneath. Oh. On the pulpit. Okay. It's in, that, it's in that package there on top of the songbook. Ah, sweet. Okay. You can't laugh at my writing. <laughs> well, Sorry, we're all laughing at you. If you can't read it, I'll have to get a pinch writer up here. <laughs> I'm hoping I don't have to do that. See, John, we laughed before we're not laughing at the writing. 
There you go. So first, no. Ooh. Ooh. We want Colossians three one through two. Is that big enough? Keep your mind focused on Christ. That's easy to do when you're not upset, right? Let's say that you're watching your six-year-old child or your six-year-old grandchild and before he came to you, he just got done eating a bunch of sugar. And now he's yours. Okay? And when you tell him to do something, he's just not listening to you. How do you keep from being so frustrated with this child that you revert to yelling? Well, you keep your mind focused on Christ. This is where prayer comes in, right? And so, in dealing with that child, to have, what is the word long-suffering? <coughs> Patience. Okay? To deal with a child that is on your last nerve, and to have patience with that child, you're going to need something more than what you have inside of you, than what your knowledge is, okay? You need Christ. Now that's a child. What happens when you're sitting in a room with another adult who is very aggressive to you, or you're standing in line at the grocery store, and the guy behind you does not like how long you're taking and writing your check to pay for your groceries? And he gets very vocal with you about that. How do you handle that conflict? Or you're driving down I-4, and somebody just cuts you off, almost killed you and whoever's in your car. Or you made the mistake of doing that, and now they're very upset with you. How do you handle those conflicts? Get a tank. What's that? Get a tank. <laughs> Keep your mind focused on Christ. When Paul gave that counsel in Colossians, did he only give it to those sitting in church for that hour or hour and a half that you're here? He gave it to them as life counsel, that in every situation that you find yourself in, you are either holy Christ or you're not. And this is the problem with Christianity today, is we compartmentalize everything. When I'm in church, I'm Christ. When I'm at work, I do my job. And whatever it takes, that's what I do. When I'm at home, I do my family, or whatever it is you do there. But when Jesus came into your heart, He came in for 24 hours out of the day. Seven days a week, 360, 65 days out of the year, right? Uh, the last time I read, it says that God never sleeps, God never slumbers. What does that mean for us? That means that there is no time in your waking or sleeping hours that God is not with you and that you're not expected to have Him as Lord over your life. So in every situation, in all that you do, you do all for the glory of God. Ricky, can you read 1 Corinthians 10.31? Now we're going to see if this is a magic eraser. <laughs> Therefore, whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Not real magic, but... Okay, that's 1 Corinthians... What? 
1031. Read it again. Therefore, whether you eat or drink, or whether or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Okay, look at the context of that verse. Whether you eat or whether you drink. Is that what Paul is only concerned with? What you're putting in your mouth? Or what you're drinking? Because he says, after that, whatever you do. What does that mean, whatever you do? Our actions. That is your entire life, right? From the time you wake up, time you go to bed, whatever you do, do all for what? So you keep your mind focused on Christ and you do all for the glory of God. Whether you eat, whether you drink, how you care for your body, what you're doing in your house, outside of your house, People see you eating. Do that for the glory of God. But not just that. He's not only concerned with that part of your life. He's concerned with every bit of your life. And that everything that you do, especially how you handle conflict, needs to be done for what? Now, how many of you in the heat of conflict, in the heat of a battle, are really thinking about the glory of God? Raise your hand. Look around. We're all in agreement here. Okay, this kind of mindset is something that has to be thought about, has to be practiced on a regular basis, or it will not happen. Okay, we talk over and over again about submitting our wills to Christ. You want to know whether you've submitted your will? When you get to this point, and you're dealing with conflict, and you're dealing with people that you may not like, that you know doesn't like you, and you're able to deal with them to the glory of God, that's when you know that you have submitted your will to God. Okay? Now, conflict. Church conflict. I come in and... I see that we're having a potluck. And I see that we're going to have a certain dish at the potluck, and I don't think we should be serving that dish. You're making that dish. Okay? But I'm not going to tell you. I'm going to go and tell Ray, and I may tell Janet, and I'm definitely going to tell Ricky. Because uh, I know Ricky will listen to me, and, and I can get him to maybe take some of this. I'm going to take Ray. Okay. So listen, no, but I'm not going to go to you because, you know, I don't want to hurt your feelings. But I've hurt your feelings today. <laughs> How do I deal with that conflict? So I didn't go to you, but I told them, you found out. Now your feelings are hurt. Okay? Did I glorify God in that situation? No. You understand why I told you last week and the week before that if you have a problem with your brother or your sister, you need to go to your brother or your sister? Yes. See, because now, not only is this between me and you, and I've hurt your feelings, but now there's Ricky, there's Ray, there's Janet, okay? Now they're all involved. And if, if, if they have taken sides, some of them say, yeah, I think that's a good idea, we shouldn't serve that, and others go, talking about. There's no reason why we shouldn't serve that. Now we have caused a split. And that's only about food. What happens when it's a really meaningful situation? Okay? So if you have a problem with your brother or your sister, what should you do? Yeah. Right. You go to your brother or sister. I'm kind of afraid to uh, erase this. <laughs> Donald, did you look at this at all? What does this do? I don't know, but if that don't work, I got something here that will. Will it work with the eraser? Yes. So can you spray that and yeah. we'll see? I worked on this. <laughs> I didn't work on this actual part. This stuff's called awesome. 
That's awesome. <laughs> spectacular bear tooth mountains. One year I ventured out in late spring with three friends. The streams were still swollen from melting snow.